welcome to Deconstructive Criticism. My name is Aaron Flam, and today we'll be talking to journalist and editor Fleming Rose about his book, The Tyranny of Silence. It covers the so-called cartoon crisis and is an interesting case study, apart from Salman Rushdie's fatwa, probably the most interesting case study on the attack against freedom of speech in the West and Europe. But first, I'd like to thank you for supporting Deconstructive Criticism. If you're not supporting me yet, you can do so on patreon.com slash Aaron Flam in one word, patreon.com slash Aaron Flam, or on Swish 0046 7689437. If you want something more material for your support, please visit my webpage, aaronflam.com slash merchandise, where you will find t-shirts and mugs with deconstructive criticisms creed, your feelings are hurting my thoughts, as well as my book, This is a Swedish Tiger, about Sweden's own culture of silence, mainly concerning the Swedish social democrats' support to and for Hitler's Nazi Germany, and how the social democrats of Sweden thereafter rekindled their friendship with another old ally of Hitler's, namely the Muslim Brotherhood, and the Islamists. The book has led to a court case against me by the state of Sweden, so if you want to know more about why I'm sued, I suggest you buy the book at aaronflam.com slash merchandise. Fleming Rose is a journalist and editor who since many years lived with protection of PET, the Danish FBI, for publishing cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad. The publication of the cartoons by the Danish paper Jyllands Posten in September of 2005 led to mass protests in the Muslim world and the West, with burning of Danish embassies, calls for boycott of Denmark, and attempted terrorist attacks against Fleming Rose and one of the cartoonists, Kurt Westergaard. The Tyranny of Silence is Fleming Rose's attempt at explaining what happened. It is a book about much more than the cartoon controversy itself. It is a text about freedom of speech, the limits of tolerance, the importance of individualism and protection of universal human rights. With those words, I present Fleming Rose. Enjoy. Welcome okay. to Deconstructive Criticism, Mr. Fleming Rose. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure. How are you today? I'm pretty good. Um, I have been looking after my grandchild uh, in these COVID-19 uh, times. So I had a lot of fun listening to him. Okay. Uh, how old is he? He is five years old. All right. He has an older brother who who was back to school, in fact. All right. So uh, he's a super the first time. Yeah. All right. Well, he's not a super spreader. I don't think so. In fact, he he was tested uh, yesterday, so um, everything should be fine. Yeah, what about you? I'm fine. Uh, you look great. Um, I haven't been infected in a in a year's time, so I'm happy about that. Sweden overall is not so good, as you might know. Um, yeah, do you think so? Well, we've had uh, 12,000 12, deaths now in uh, in a year. Yeah. Uh, which, compared to the other Scandinavian countries, at least, is uh, uh, well, uh, we're not uh, we're not leading I in low deaths. That's for mm. damn sure. Yeah, but so, I think the jury is still out. But um, because there are other factors, you know, I think it's too simplistic to look at uh, cor the coronavirus. Um, a narrow sense. You also have to look at at uh, suicides, um, non-diagnosed uh, cancer, and things like that over the longer term. That are you know diseases that are not being treated because all the focus has been on uh, lockdown and um, and uh, treating the coronavirus. But I think we learn new things every day. Absolutely. You know, and some, we're not here to discuss the coronavirus after all. <laughs> Fortunately, that's not yes. my field of expertise. No, um, I've read your book, The Tyranny of Silence, published at Cato Institute. It's a riveting read, uh, very troublesome. But before we do that, I usually start off the show with a very broad question to my guest in order mm -hmm. to let you yourself define you. So in your own words, who are you, Fleming Rose? Um, well, I will say in this context, um, I am a journalist 
former editor and a former foreign cor- foreign correspondent uh, who spent 12 years first as a student and then as a foreign correspondent uh, based in Moscow. So I covered, I lived in the Soviet Union um, in 1980-81. So I had the, pr- the privilege of living in a totalitarian uh, dictatorship. And uh, I covered the fall of the Soviet Union. I lived in Russia from 1990 to 96. And then again from 1999 until 2004. I used to work as a translator. I translated novels and uh, nonfiction books uh, from Russian uh, into Danish. And I also worked as a translator uh, at the Danish Refugee Council, where I helped um, people from the then Soviet Union. Uh, people of mostly Jewish background uh, integrating into uh, Danish society. And through that work, I got in touch with dissidents uh, who were based in Western Europe. And I think this is, in fact, the main frame, if you want to understand my approach to uh, free speech and why I got involved in this so-called cartoon affair. Uh, it's now many years ago, but um, uh, you know the uh, the aftershock <laughs> is still being uh, filled. I still live with bodyguards, even though this happened, you know, more than 15 years ago. Um, but 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 my approach to free speech. Um, and my adversity to self-censorship um, was very much a product of my experience living in the Soviet Union and being in touch with people who had been willing to sacrifice their freedom in order to be able to speak their minds and being able to disagree with um, with the Soviet government. Um, I... I know uh, Natan Sharansky, um, a Jewish immigrant from the uh, Soviet Union, who is who who who, you know, he spent I think nine years in a labor camp in uh, in in the Urals, and he was exchanged I think in 1986 with a um, Soviet spy, and he went immediately to Israel and and uh, became. A famous politician in Israel, he established his own party, and I think his story, uh, you know, I in in the book I quote from his book, The Case for Democracy, um, and I interviewed him a couple of times in uh, Jerusalem, and he made quite an impression uh, on me, and he's one of those dissidents. Um, who paid a price for um, for insisting on their right to um, to freedom of expression and and religion? And you also pay a price, since you, as you say, you live with the bodyguards twenty four seven, I suppose. Yes, but I still I I think I'm privileged uh, compared to people like Sharansky, and the the big fundamental difference that makes it difficult to compare my situation to their situation is that I have the support of the Danish state. Yes. Uh, uh, the Danish government uh, is supporting me, and in fact, they are paying for my security, uh, which is a huge and fundamental uh, difference. Uh, and and in that sense, I feel very privileged. I'm not saying it's easy to live with bodyguards. That's not the case. And uh, I can, you know, I can... I can tell you uh, long and maybe boring anecdotes about uh, about what kind of psychological challenge that is. But I don't feel, you know, I don't feel threatened in my day to day life, um, like when you are living in in a totalitarian dictatorship where you always have to watch your back because the state is everywhere. My situation is very different. Yes, at least you get to play with your grandchild. Um, exactly. So um, I know it's been uh, quite a while since the so-called cartoon crisis or cartoon gate. Um, 16 years now, right? 
15 plus, 15 plus. I think. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I would, uh, because There's I read 16, your book yeah, and, yeah. And, and, it, and it's uh, partly, not entirely, but partly about the cartoon crisis. And uh, so could you describe what you've written to me? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's, the, the book was published on the fifth anniversary of the publication of the cartoons. They were published in September 2005, and my book was published in Danish in September 2010. The version you read was published in 2014 in the United States. Uh, and it means that, you know, I was offered um, to, to write a book in the immediate aftermath. And that that was in fact my intention. And 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 the debate that I was involved in in 2005, 2006, and in the following years was quite heated. And 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 my uh, original intention was to write a book, you know, documenting why I am right and others are wrong. <laughs> Um, but in, 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 in the process, um, I discovered that, you know, you can have different opinions about those cartoons and it's not, uh, so, it's not so that one point of view is the right one. So, so I figured out that what I have to do is to write my own story and why I think the way I do. Um, and, and this was a consequence of me traveling around the world for five years. You know, I was in Jerusalem, I was in Doha, I was in Russia, in Ukraine, in Sweden, Norway, United States, uh, in Canada. Um, I traveled around the world and, and debated uh, the cartoons and the principles of free speech on, on, on very different platforms. And, and doing that, I discovered that, you know, it's more or less the same debate everywhere. But the way you slice um, the cake between free speech and limitations on free speech is different from society to, to society. And it's also different in every society. You know, people do have different perceptions and different understandings what's what what should be allowed to be said in public and what should not be allowed and and you as a stand-up comedian I, I think that's in fact part of your profession uh, to challenge and find out where those borders are because that's quite often where things get funny but it's also sometimes where what is intended to be funny is not perceived as funny. <laughs> uh, I've noticed. You can, you, yeah. <laughs> you can never be sure whether a joke will work or not. Uh, but, but the point is to, to be on the edge. Um, so before we get ahead of ourselves yeah. and delve more into free speech, and yeah. especially for my younger listeners who might, or my older listeners who might be demented and have forgotten, um, uh, what was the cartoon crisis and what was your logic behind publishing these cartoons? In, I think, at the end of August nine, uh, 2005, a Danish children's writer, his name is Kor Blutken, sounds Norwegian in fact, uh, um, went public. He gave an interview to the Danish wire service, wire news service, Ritzau Bureau, <clears throat> saying that he had written a book for children about the life of the Prophet Muhammad, but that he had had difficulties finding an illustrator for the book. Um, that is, that, 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 that illustrators were committing self-censorship. They, they didn't want to do this, uh, or some of them, because they were afraid of the consequences. And this was... Uh, nationwide big star in Denmark. It was on the front page of every newspaper. Also, and why did he uh, want to do a children's book about the life of Muhammad? Was he a racist? Uh, 
I don't think so, but he was accused of being a racist, um, and and the, the 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 and 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 in fact the illustrations in the book they are very neutral. You know, it's it's not cartoons; it's illustrations. It's it's realistic. You would say images done in the realistic tradition, uh, like a, a, a reportage uh, from a court. Uh, case, uh, no distorted features, but, 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 but this writer insisted on um, face illustrations of the main character because that is the way you do a children's book in Denmark. I mean, you you in spite of the fact that some Muslims um, accept a prohibition on images of the face of Muhammad. In fact, it's nowhere written in the Quran. I found out doing research for that book. Uh, it's not anywhere in the Quran that you have this uh, taboo. Uh, it was a consequence of of living um, uh, Islam through the ages that it was convenient for some Muslims to um, to impose uh, a prohibition on images of the Prophet. But that's another story. But this children's writer, this, this story was on the front page of every newspaper. We published uh, illustrations from the book, uh, Jyllands Posten, the newspaper where I used to work, but other papers did as well. And then, uh, then, um, and, um, then we had a following up debate at the paper. You know, are there more angles to cover? Uh, the first round of the coverage we called illustrators, translators, um, uh, museum directors, uh, movie makers to find out is there self-censorship or not among uh, people in cultural life in Denmark. And some said, uh, no, there is no self-censorship. This is an invented crisis uh, to sell more books. Uh, others were saying, yes, there is self-censorship and it is a problem. So you had these two positions. And and in order to continue the debate and, and and frame it according to a fundamental journalistic principle saying, don't tell, show, uh, a reporter at the paper came up with this idea. Uh, let's find out uh, whether there's self-censorship or not by inviting uh, cartoonists or illustrators to draw the profit. Um, and it's a very simple, but I think very it's it's a it's it's a genial idea, because it's so simple. Uh, and uh, and and that idea um, landed on my table, and uh, I had been in touch with the chairman of the the Danish Cartoonist Society a few weeks before, so I got in touch with him. He spoke to his members, and then I wrote a letter to them, inviting them to draw the prophet as they see him. Um, so and, not a caricature, and, or just the you know there. If you, you I mean, um, uh, you can you can Google uh, Danish cartoons or Muhammad cartoons, and you can see uh, the full page. I received twelve uh, images, but uh, and and the images are very different. They are there's there's a diversity both in whom is targeted for satire uh, and the way the prophet is uh, uh, depicted. Uh, but you can say, unfortunately, because of the conflict, everybody focused on one single cartoon, the one of, uh, of, of the prophet with a bomb in his turban, uh, done by uh, Kurt Westergaard, who was a cartoonist at Ulands Posten. And 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 even though I understand that there are Muslims who were upset by that cartoon, I think it can be it can like every image, it can be interpreted in many different ways. I myself uh, understood that cartoon as saying there are Muslims, there are some Muslims who, in the name of their religion, commit violence in the name of the prophet commit violence. And therefore you had, you know, the bomb in, in, in the term of the prophet. He, he was, he might not be aware of it. Um, and I think that was in fact, 
a pretty accurate um, uh, interpretation of what was happening in reality. Um, uh, we had uh, terrorist attacks committed by, pe- by people who called themselves Muslims, and they were committing these terrorist attacks in the name of uh, their prophet or in the name of their religion. That's a fact. Yes, so they were true. But then uh, what happened after the publication of these cartoons? Because you did, you, you published them uh, to sort of find out how many would self-censor at this request. And you got a fair share of uh, people who wouldn't draw Mohammed, right? Well, um, I, I received 12 cartoons from 25 active members of uh, uh, the Danish Cartoonist uh, Association. One cartoonist specifically called me and said he would not participate because he was afraid. And it turns out that uh, the illustrator, and that was also the starting point of, of, of our initiative, the illustrator who did the illustrations for the children's book insisted on anonymity. And that was something I had known from the Soviet Union, where you had people signing, you know, uh, letters anonymously, uh, books being published in in the West uh, under pseudonyms uh, and things like that. Self-censorship to me means that you would like to say something, you would like to publish something, but you are afraid of doing it because of what might happen to you. That means self-censorship is not the same as good manners. You know, when I go to a restaurant, I, I eat with a knife and a fork. Uh, uh, I follow certain uh, uh, customs, but I do it voluntarily. If I, if, I, if I don't want to eat that way, I will not go to a restaurant. I will find another way uh, 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 to, to get food. So, so there is this, this, this uh, element of a sense of intimidation and fear when it comes to self-censorship. Because some people say, well, we all have to self-censor. You know, if we don't self-censor, we will not be able to you know, live together. And that's true, but that is not self-censorship to me. It is to follow certain norms and, and customs. And in this case, when we are used to satire when it comes to Jesus Christ um, and 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 the secular uh, uh, sacred figures and so on and so forth. Uh, why shouldn't we be allowed to uh, do satire when it comes to Islam? And and that was to me that was a fundamental uh, idea. Um, uh, you know, pursuing this project. You know, by publishing those cartoons, I and my newspaper said to Muslims in Denmark. Uh, we do not expect more of you. We do not expect less of you. We expect of you exactly the same as we do of every other group and individual in our society. And in that fact lies a fact of recognition. We recognize you as full and mature members of our society, not as foreigners, not as outsiders that we have to treat as guests, you know, when you are over polite. Uh, when they visit your home, they are here to stay. Um, so I think, in fact, you can say it was an integration project. Because uh, there is a difference between farting in a crowded room, out of poli- uh, uh, abstaining from farting in a crowded room from politeness, and abstaining from farting because you will get killed if you fart in a crowded room. Exactly. All right. So uh, you published these, and then what happened? Um, the first day I got um, a call from a newspaper vendor in uh, the western part of Copenhagen who uh, uh, complained and said he would he was a Muslim, um, that he would not sell uh, our newspaper anymore. And I didn't pay much attention because as, as an editor, I received this, this call on a daily or weekly basis. Uh, you know, people react to what's uh, printed in the newspaper, people on... Uh, uns- uh, unsubscribe the paper if they are dis- dissatisfied with an article or an editorial or something else. Uh, so I didn't I didn't pay much attention and 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 not much happened. Uh, but 
Within two or three weeks, uh, there was a demonstration in Copenhagen, um, um, you know, protesting uh, the cartoons, and um, and 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 then you know a heated debate started in Denmark, and death threats, uh, you know, began being issued against the newspaper and the cartoonist, uh, and there was some you know um, uh, on. Um, Bad accidents. In fact, uh, a young man was being, you know, arrested uh, with a knife in his uh, bag on his way to uh, the homes of two of the cartoonists uh, with their private addresses and and things like that. Uh, uh, quite unpleasant. But but basically, it was a it was a peaceful and heated debate in Denmark, and it went in waves. Uh, and you know, there were from time to time. I did some some interviews with uh, with uh, international publications, uh, but it wasn't an, an international story until um, a group of Danish imams traveled to the Middle East um, in December 2005, and again in January 2006. They visited the uh, the summit of the uh, organization of the Islamic Conference in Mecca. Uh, bringing the cartoons and, in fact, also some cartoons that had never been published in the paper and were far more offensive than the ones that had been published, and 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 uh, they they were able to um, persuade uh, these Islamic countries to pass a resolution condemning uh, the cartoons and calling, you know, for raising this uh, in the UN. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton was there, and he also condemned the uh, cartoons, uh, although he didn't know the context. Um, and 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 then they also traveled to Egypt. Egypt was a driver of this crisis in the beginning because you, in 2000, November 2005, you had elections in Egypt, and for the first time for many years, the Muslim Brotherhood was allowed to run in that election. Uh, under pressure from the Bush uh, government, and and Mubarak, the Mubarak regime, who basically was secular uh, and and wanted to demonstrate that he was a true defender of Muslims, uh, this was a you know a, f a gift from heaven <laughs> uh, for him. So so he exploited this issue to. Um, to mobilize uh, people in Egypt against Denmark, boycotting Danish products uh, and things like that. Although in November, I think 2005, eight of the cartoons were published on the front page of an Egyptian newspaper. Uh, <laughs> um, but I would say that the, the, the international, what I learned about uh, the, you know, the mechanisms here is that you had, you had a local issue and 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 it was nowhere, you know, written um, in iron that this would be a global crisis. You know, people were saying afterwards, you, you should have known and blah, blah, blah. No, this was a matter of uh, coincidences. Um, and, and I found out that at other times you had publications of uh, the prophet that did not trigger these kind of, uh, you know, international crises. But it turned out that in Egypt, you had a domestic political situation that, 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 that could exploit these cartoons. You had the same in the Palestinian territories where you had an election in January 2006, and the secular Fatah used the cartoons against uh, the, uh, the the Islamist uh, Hamas movement. Uh, you had a, you had similar cases in Pakistan, and you had uh, Al Qawadawi, uh, the uh, the Islamist uh, preacher. Uh, I think he's based in Doha, who had a show on Al Jazeera calling for a day of rage against uh, Denmark. He's the spiritual and, leader uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. So, uh, so, so, but, but, you know, all this was driven by domestic situations, and not by, and not by the content of the public of, of the cartoons in and by itself. The cartoons were used for other ends, 
and and that's the way it 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 turned into a global crisis at the end of January, beginning of February two thousand six. Yeah, in the book you write uh, in the beginning of the book actually you write that you you visited the Islam scholar uh, Bernard Le- uh, Lewis in yes. uh, two thousand and six and asked him, and he had an interesting theory why suddenly non-Muslims in Europe were subjects of Islamic law, because in a sense, uh, this is whatever it says in the Quran, this is now Islamic law, you're not supposed to make uh, images of Muhammad. And and uh, what was his thoughts on this? Well, Bernard Lewis, uh, whom I interviewed at Princeton um, in the United States, uh, and at that time I think he was already... Um, uh, 93 or 94 years old, but he had a very, very clear mind. I think he lived until 103 or something. Um, but but his point was that th- this was something new um, that was a consequence of migration of uh, Muslims to non-Islamic countries. Uh, traditionally, um, Islamic law doesn't apply in non-Islamic countries. Uh, and that has never been the case uh, throughout history, meaning that when, 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 when Muslims were traveling to other parts of the world, they did not insist on applying Islamic law in, in non-Islamic countries. So to him, this was in fact one of the first instances where Muslims living in non-Islamic majority countries were insisting on imposing Islamic law on non-Muslims. Because Denmark uh, is not part of the Ummah. No, and we are not even part of uh, of the uh, Conference of Islamic Countries. Uh, true. So, but, but, but it is kind of strange because in Islam there are, uh, you have the Ummah, which is the Islamic world, yes. and, then, and then you have the non-Muslim countries, and then you have these in-between countries. Uh, dimmy countries, you could call yeah, them. Yeah, yes, yes, exactly. So, uh, in his view, uh, this was like a um, a starting point for for Europe being seen in the Islamic world as dimmy countries. Yes, uh, yes, uh, as a potential coming, you know, Islamic uh, uh, part of the world. Yes. And how how did you react to this when you heard him say that? Out of pure curiosity, from on my part, you know, I I found it very interesting. You know, I'm not an expert on Islam, uh, even though I had a crash course back in 2005 and 2006. Um, uh, I found it very interesting, um, and it 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 kind of put things, you know, into historical perspective. Uh, but I also heard from from a Danish expert on the Islamic world. Another point that I found interesting, because as you might know, this taboo on depictions of the Prophet is a Sunni Islamic uh, phenomena. In fact, until this crisis, if you went to Tehran, to the Shia world, you could you could buy posters uh, with depictions of the, uh, of the Prophet. Uh, so there's no prohibition on images of the Prophet within Shia Islam. Um, and and this um, um, expert on Islam in Denmark, who had been living in Beirut at some point, said that 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 the problem here is that very few uh, Sunni Muslims have have been living as minorities in the Islamic world. Uh, they are they are mostly uh, the majority in the countries where they live, and 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 therefore they were in fact behaving like a majority in Denmark, uh, trying to impose their norms and standards, uh, rules of their religion on society at large. And and to me, in fact, that that was the essence of this conflict that you had some Muslims who were insisting on, uh, on, on applying their taboos and rules on everybody, which basically meant that I, as a non-Muslim, had to submit myself to 
Muslim taboos in the public domain. And to me, that is that is uh, incompatible with a secular liberal democracy. You know, I understand when I go to a mosque, of course, I behave in accordance with Islamic law. I take off my shoes. I will not bring cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad. If I, if I bring my daughter, she will, you know, uh, be addressed uh, accordingly, but when but when Muslims outside their holy houses or sacred places uh, demand that I um, that I submit myself to their rules, I don't think they are asking for my respect. I think they are asking for my submission, and and that is incompatible with a, a, a liberal secular d- democracy. Absolutely, but. Uh, I've heard this argument about uh, minorities uh, having a hard time adapting to being minorities before, but I only hear it about uh, Sunni Muslims. I don't hear it about the Han Chinese, because if you apply the same logic to the Han Chinese, then uh, Chinatowns all over the world would, you know, uh, be uh, filled with demonstrations all the time. And uh, so so I'm, I'm not sure it's just... Uh, it's just an issue of minorities in general, at least, having a problem adapting. It's a specific minority in this case. Yeah, but it's also because it's, I mean, like Christianity and Judaism, Islam uh, is a universal, universal, uh, it it has universal um, uh, uh, principles and you know, I'm not an expert on Islam, so I, I you know, I, I do not pretend. Uh, but I think, I really think that Islam is living through a crisis, um, and 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 what we are experiencing in 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 Europe when it comes to problems with integration and uh, coexistence, I think it's. It's it's part of that uh, 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 process, um, and I think it's. I think within Islam, you know, from my point of view, as a non-Muslim, um, and as a strong believer in freedom of expression, freedom of religion, I think that 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 Muslims in Europe, and in other parts of the world, but I live in Europe, so I care about that. I think they have to work out. A doctrine of their faith that is uh, compatible with with being able to live with blasphemy. That is, too many Muslims living in Europe believe that it's okay to kill people if uh, they commit blasphemy, because they believe it is justified uh, uh, by their faith, and they also believe it's okay to kill people who commit uh, apostasy, like uh, Salman Rushdie, that if you don't have a f- the, you are born a Muslim and you cannot leave your religion uh, voluntarily. Uh, if you do that, you have committed a capital crime. And 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 if you take pa- Pakistan, I mean, you have the death sentence in Pakistan for blasphemy, meaning that that if you kill a thousand people in a terrorist attack. Uh, this is comparable uh, from the point of view of law enforcement and the criminal code to uh, telling a joke about the Prophet Muhammad. And, yes. and, 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 and I think that is, uh, that is a huge problem. How would you describe the difference between actions and words? Because there seems to be uh, in the West as well nowadays, uh, the, the line has become blurred between action and words. Yeah, that's true, and and uh, you know I, I I I graduated in in uh, linguistics. Uh, I studied linguistics, so I understand that you can have speech acts, uh, and you can have these philosophical decision uh, uh, definitions, and you can have a discussion about that. But in this context, I think it's very important to distinguish between words and deeds, between words and actions. Uh, and 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 this dis- distinction is very important because the fight in Europe for freedom of expression and against censorship started with imposing this distinction between words and action uh, um, after the wars of religion in Europe in uh, the 15th, 16th, and 17th century, um, where in fact words were being equated to actions in the sense that if you if you 
if you said something critical about uh, the church, Catholic uh, country, um, uh, you would be killed. Uh, you would have your tongue, uh, you know, cut off uh, uh, or burned on the stake uh, because those words were being perceived as a physical attack on 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 the social, political, and religious order of uh, of, of of a community, which meant that Catholics could kill Protestants. And Protestants could kill uh, Catholics and Christians could kill Jews and uh, Christian minorities and so on and so forth. Until until the moment when, uh, when the, a majority understood we cannot go on like this. We have to accept and work out a doctrine of, of, of religious tolerance, meaning that we make a distinction uh, between saying something offensive uh, and committing, you know, a criminal offense. Uh, so that even though I hate uh, the Protestant version of uh, Christianity, I will not kill a Protestant for practicing his uh, faith, even though he is a minority in this Catholic uh, country. And, and this way, in Europe, we worked out uh, a, a doctrine of religious tolerance, then later became a doctrine of political tolerance and religious pluralism and political pluralism that is based on the distinction between words and action, uh, basically implying that, that on the one end of the spectrum, you have thoughts, and on the other end, you have uh, actions. And somewhere in between, you have words. I, as, as a liberal, tend to think that words are more like thoughts, while people who are, you know, um, uh, who, who are arguing for, for more limitations on speech tend to equate uh, words and actions. And, I, and, and, and uh, you know, a fundamental difference between a dictatorship and a democracy is, in fact, when it comes to this distinction, distinction between words and action. Uh, uh, in, in a democracy and in a dictatorship, you, you will all, everybody will be uh, um, uh, uh, prosecuted for tax violations, uh, murder, um, stealing, uh, uh, drunk driving, fast driving. Uh, these offenses, actions are both a criminal offense in a dictatorship and in a democracy. But the difference is that in a dictatorship, uh, you treat descending thoughts and ideas as if they were criminal actions. That's why Natan Sharansky, whom we spoke about, talked about in the beginning, or Andrei Sakharov or Alexander Solzhenitsyn, you know, the heroes of my life, they spent time behind bars or in labor camps or in exile, uh, even though they, they did not do anything, you know, to harm other people. They were just speaking uh, uh, and thinking uh, freely. And, and my concern now is that this um, distinction between words and action uh, is being eroded in liberal democracies in uh, in the West. And that is a huge danger against free speech. Yes, because you say you view speech differently in a dictatorship and a democracy. But depending on how you view speech as actions or thoughts, uh, or more to one side or the other, uh, you also get different concepts of tolerance. Absolutely. And, and uh, yes, uh, that's a very good point. And, and thank you for pointing it out. Uh, because you were because, using the word tolerance very cavalierly. Exactly. And in fact, distorted. Uh, uh, tolerance these days means that um, you, you might have a right to say what you're saying, but I don't like it. So therefore, please shut up. Or I don't like what you're saying, and therefore I don't think you have a right to say it. 
So for instance, if you say something that so if you say something I don't like, you are intolerant. While in fact it's exactly the other way around. Because to me, the definition of tolerance is the ability to live with things that you hate, that you actively dislike, without resorting to uh, prohibition, censorship, intimidation, violence, or threats. That is the definition of tolerance. So it's not, it's not you who uh, tell a joke. Um, uh, uh, that is, that is intolerant. It is the guy who is listening to your joke and want to shut you down. While in our society today, if if you tell uh, a nasty joke or a joke that makes fun of a group of people, people will say you are intolerant. But that is that is turning the 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 historical understanding of tolerance on its head. The the way it was an understood uh, in the aftermath of the wars of religion was in fact the ability of Protestants being able to live with Catholics without killing them or banning them. That that is the foundation of uh, tolerance. And and in order to establish uh, free speech or rehabilitate free speech in our part of the world, I think we have to return to the original. Uh, concept of uh, tolerance as as having to do with our ability to live with things that we don't like, uh, without without banning them, without canceling them, without censoring them, without uh, threatening them, or even killing them. So, if you would exemplify this uh, idea, would you say, for instance, oh, sorry. I will have to apologize to the studio owner after I'm done with this. Uh, so to exemplify <laughs> maybe, maybe, this maybe idea. Maybe we said something intolerant. <laughs> well, I just continually, wherever I end up, I always, for some reason, do slapstick. <laughs> so um, would you say, for instance, if someone threw their daughter off a balcony for wearing a tube top, uh, and I would make a joke about this, uh, Who's the intolerant? And he, and he gets offended by my joke. Who's the intolerant person here? Oh, this is the one who is, uh, who is doing that to his daughter. Well, of course. you might argue that, but you like freedom. Uh, so, uh, you know, <laughs> different. Yeah, so, but uh, we, 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 we need to get our priorities uh, straight. But it's very easy to get confused and, and uh, target the messenger. Um, and um, uh, and it's also, of course, when you are telling a joke like that, you make that person uh, uncomfortable. And uh, and 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 one of the challenges of 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 learning to be tolerant because we are not born tolerant. I think we are in fact born intolerant. <laughs> uh, we have to learn it, and it's very painful and difficult to live side by side with people uh, whose faith and way of life and tasters uh, you don't like. Um, but, 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 but being, um, being tolerant doesn't necessarily mean just to shut up. And, you know, like the, the Ottoman Empire, you live in separate uh, the Jews in one quarter of uh, the city, uh, the Christians in another, and the Muslims in other places. No, I think, in fact, part of being tolerant is also uh, daring to speak out against the things you don't like. But so, you don't you you don't ban things and you don't threaten, intimidate, and uh, use violence. Because that's where you draw the line between yes. speech and action. Yes, and it does not mean to shut up. To shut up is not being tolerant. Because uh, you got a, a, a few uh, allegations against your publication of these cartoons. Um, one that seemed to have been recurring was that the cartoons have been likened to the Nazi cartoons about the Jews in Nazi Germany. How would you respond to that? I think it's uh, it's very unpleasant <laughs> to be um, uh, to being labeled as uh, you know semi-Nazi um, or as a racist or uh, anti-Semite uh, or similar 
uh, that, that, that those cartoons are like their Stürmer uh, in, uh, in, in, in Nazi Germany? I don't think so. Uh, and, and the fundamental difference here is while, um, while uh, anti-Semitic cartoons is stereotyping the Jew uh, you know, with a nose and uh, all these features, uh, um, uh, there, there, there is no average Muslim or no stereotype of the Muslim in our cartoons. So, so they are in fact not targeting a group. I mean, you have you have Muslims who are black, you have Muslims who are white, you have Muslims who are you know red. I don't know. Uh, tall and small uh, uh, in in China, in the Middle East, in the United States, in Europe, uh, in Africa. Um, uh, there is a fundamental difference between targeting uh, a group of people based on their ethnicity uh, and making fun of their religion. Um, but the situation uh, and, and, between... and this is about ideas. This is about ideas, uh, um, and and I know I know a lot of people find it difficult. But I think, in fact, this is a fundamental idea uh, of 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 the Enlightenment tradition, which I kind of identify with. That that you cannot you you can create a fence around people, but you cannot. You cannot create a fence or build a fence or wall around ideas, and if you if you if you do that, you end up in a, a tyranny of silence or in a, a dictatorship. Yes, because there's also a difference between uh, because when I read uh, when I did research for this, I read your book and I did some research, and one of the things was that uh, a lot of people nowadays they think that uh, muslims in europe today are like the jews in nazi germany in the 30s yeah, that is outrageous i mean uh, How so? uh well because uh, uh, the jews of nazi germany they were stripped of all their rights as citizens uh, while muslims in europe they they have they have the same equality and freedom as i do uh, they are not being singled out, uh, you know, with their shops. Uh, they are not. Uh, they have access to all professions, uh, uh, and the Jews were not uh, enjoying those rights in Nazi Germany. I mean, they were stripped of their right to be teachers, doctors, uh, uh, lawyers. Uh, uh, they were not allowed to uh, to drive on the bus, uh, to sit on benches in in the park, and finally, they were being stripped of their citizenship. Nothing like this, and and their shops were being attacked uh, uh, in 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 Germany. Nothing like this is happening to uh, to Muslims in uh, in 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 Europe. So uh, I'm going to have to circle back some here. Yeah, because when you published these cartoons, they weren't against Muslims as a group, were they? They were against the Holy Prophet they were, of they, Islam. They were about self censorship uh, when it comes to. I I would say they were not. They, no, they were they were targeting um, um, uh, creative people in Denmark and Western Europe. How so? And challenge him. How so? Well, uh, that um, uh, a stand-up comedian in Denmark who said, you know, I'm not afraid of pissing on the Bible in front of a camera, but I'm I dare not do the same thing with the Quran, and it annoys me. Um, uh, um, a museum in uh, in London uh, that removes uh, an installation um, uh, uh, depicting a copy of the Quran, the Bible, and the Talmud torn into pieces, uh, called "God is uh, Great." Uh, in the aftermath of the seven seven bombings in London in two thousand five, that had nothing to do with Jews and Christians in, in London, but only with uh, uh, Muslims. Um, because uh, that instance, that's John Latham, right? God is exactly. great. Yes, yes uh, exactly. He had made a piece uh, uh, reflecting what he thought about the Iraq war, where he had cut up uh, an Old Testament, a New Testament, and a Quran, and put them inside a glass, a piece of glass. And I think it was the Tate Britain who removed it from the exhibition. Exactly. 
Yes, without asking John Latham and without asking the curator of, of the exhibition. Uh, it was a clear example of self-censorship. And in fact, in Sweden, in Gothenburg, Sweden, at the World Museum in Sweden, there was a similar case uh, um, with, uh, with a painting um, done by an Algerian French female artist depicting Lose a man and a woman having sex. Yeah. With the first words from the Quran on, on, on the image. Uh, um, and a lot of Muslims in Sweden complained and, and, and the director of the museum, who happened to be Danish, in fact, removed the painting. But when an Iranian born uh, female artist who had fled to Sweden from a theocracy in Iran, uh, organized a one woman demonstration in front of the museum and, and demanded that this painting being reinstated, nothing happened. Uh, because she did not threaten anybody or or, or create fear. Um, um, so so um, uh, I I think the issue. I mean, you know, I didn't know almost anything about Islam when I commissioned those cartoons, but but the point was that you had filmmakers, museum curators, uh, uh, theaters. Uh, Newspapers, book publishers, who seem to um, to to commit self censorship and making a difference between the way they uh, treated Islam and the way they treated other ideas. Because if that is the case, then uh, uh, Muslims don't have the same rights as other European citizens. They have the same right plus the right not to be offended. Exactly. And in that way, we are not treating them as grown-ups. I think, in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's, in, it's, if I was a Muslim, I would be humiliated, uh, feel humiliated and, 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 and being treated like a, like, like a, like a child. You know, I am, I am able on my own, I have a rational mind. Uh, I can make up my own mind about, um, what I read and 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 hear and uh, make a decision about how I want to react to this. Uh, there, there is, you know, I'm not an animal. That, that you, you humans are not not animals. That you push a button and then you get a certain kind of reaction. No, we are different because we we can think and um, and 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 we can decide how we are going to react to uh, what other people uh, say and do. Yes, um, and you said Bill Clinton condemned your pub publication of the cartoons. Uh, how did the EU react uh, to the OIC demands? This is the uh, Organization of Islamic Conference that you that you referenced earlier. Yeah, uh, Javier Solana, uh, who was then the EU's foreign minister, um, uh, traveled to uh, I think uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And and said to um, uh, the Muslim world that uh, I we will guarantee that this is not going to happen again. So we'll basically, sure he was willing to curtail to our rights for their benefit. And why do you think that is? Yeah. I don't know. You have to ask him. But I I, I really think it uh, it sounded quite strange, and nobody gave him the, him that mandate. He is not writing the laws in Denmark or in Sweden, for that matter. Uh, but it's a way, it was a way of, 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 of trying to calm down a situation in a very, I would say, sh short-sighted way. Uh, because, you know, we know from history that if you give in to threats and intimidation, you will not get less of it. You, you will get more of it because you show that it works. So why stop? If you get your way once, why not? try, you know, another time and a third time and a fourth time. Um, and this was, was very, in the first um, decade of the 2000s. So yes, where, yes. where are we now? Oh, now we are living in a very different uh, time, I think. Uh, and I, you know, I can only imagine what a cartoon crisis today would look like. Remember in 2005, uh, uh, Facebook was just created. Uh, uh, we didn't have Twitter. Uh, we didn't have social media. We had emails. Uh, I received a lot of emails from around the world. 
we had a website, uh, um, but but uh, so so the uh, the technological communication infrastructure has changed. Uh, we also didn't have YouTube on that scale back in 2005, uh, six. Uh, but I would also say that um, that that the cartoon crisis is very interesting as as a kind of masterclass uh, in the kind of issues we are debating today. Um, that has to do with the uh, communication technology and migration. Uh, and the, the I know we are living in a time of Corona, so we are not traveling that much, but, but what, what characterizes our world today is how cheap and easy it is to travel and move. And people are moving around at a scale and in numbers never seen before. And and the cartoon crisis was a very, um, very interesting case in the kind of clashes we are experiencing in this new world of, of, uh, of communication technology and migration, where we have to, where we are all either virtual or physical neighbors. And we have to manage this growing diversity. And I think basically there are two ways to do that. You can either say, you know, if you accept my taboo, I will accept your taboo. Uh, you call this that a every gr time, grievance culture in, in your uh, book. Exactly. Yes. And it, it, it opens, it opens you know, the floodgates for, for censorship because every time you say something I don't like, I can just say, this offends me, so please shut up. Uh, so this is one way to go, you know, if you accept my taboo, I'll accept yours. It sounds nice, but it, it will end in a tyranny of silence because there's always somebody out there who, who will be offended by what somebody says. The other way to go is to ask ourselves, what are the minimal limitations that we need to uh, to live in peace in a in this world of diversity, and I think that is incitement to violence. That is the fundamental uh, limitation on freedom of expression that we need. But of course, the other the other part of the equation is that we have to we have to learn how to live with things that we don't like. Uh, how to live with people practicing a faith or saying things about what I think and believe in that uh, I don't like. Um, and, and, and that is not easy. Uh, it's easier think, if you have comedy. Exactly. That's a, that's a very important part of it. We should be able to, to laugh of ourselves. Uh, that's very important. That's also part of the European tradition uh, of, of, uh, of uh, satire. But I think we have to learn you know, I give this example of of uh, every time a public official in in today in Europe or in the West, uh, you know, has said something bad, they are being sent in sensitivity training. So you have to learn, you know, how to be sensitive. And I think we have to be sent to insensitivity training. So we grow thicker skins uh, and not. I know, could hold not, courses in that. Exactly, uh, and in fact, in in in, in a practical way, yes. <laughs> uh, tell dirty jokes or bad jokes, and and see how people uh, react uh, and and learn to live with that. And I also know, in fact, I I think you know this from your own practice, but I I I, I know from stand-up comedians comedians in the UK that they have sensed a fundamental shift in what they can make fun, what, what kind of jokes they can tell. And the scope is really growing uh, narrower and narrower. Um, and, and that is just one indicator of, uh, of the fact that freedom of expression is in bad standing. And I think for, for a lot of people uh, in Europe today and in the United States and other parts of the world, free speech is no longer a uh, fundamental value. Uh, other values like the right to not be offended, the, light, the, the right to a safe space, 
to dignity uh, and so on and so forth, uh, trumps um, uh, freedom of expression. And 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 to me, <clears throat> this is also proof of the fact that free speech is not only about the law. You know, you can have a very good law, like in the United States, you have the First Amendment, you have a better protection of free speech compared to anywhere in the world. But free speech is also about social and cultural norms. If you, if you don't have a culture of freedom of expression, you can have the best law in the world, but you will not have freedom of expression because people are being socially and professionally ostracized if they say something wrong, even though it is perfectly legal. You know, they will lose their job, they will lose their friends, they will be cancelled, and so on and so forth. Yeah, you make this very interesting distinction between a free society and what you call a fear society. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and you know, this is, this is also from my experience in the Soviet Union, uh, where I sensed, you know, coming from Denmark in 1980 as a young student, you just had this sense of fear you know, it was like hanging in the air. People were being afraid of speaking to a foreigner like me, uh, dealing with foreigners and, and you know, whispering uh, in the streets or sitting in the kitchen and having all the conversations that you could not have on your workplace or in public transportation and, and so on. So I think this is, in fact, a decision we have to make. I think fear, in fact, is is the most important trigger uh, for censorship. Um, uh, if you, and you can see it with the corona uh, restrictions in, 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 in the free world. If you are able to frame an issue as a choice between life and death, that if you don't do this, there is the fear that you will die or that uh, very bad things will happen, then you are willing to accept almost any restriction on your freedom. Uh, and therefore, I think we have to be very alert when people are playing the fear card. Um, and it also comes, to, it also has to do with counterterrorism uh, restrictions on civil liberties, even though I, you know, I live with the consequences of a terrorist threat. But I, I think sometimes that, 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 that counterterrorism uh, uh, law has gone too far. Uh, and because this is an issue for the security services, it's very easy, it's very difficult to find out how these laws worked, work. You know, ha have they in fact been able to prevent uh, terrorist attacks? Uh, it's quite difficult to find out. And, but but you, you, you know, you have this old saying by Benjamin Franklin, one of the founders of the United States, who said that if you are willing to uh, sacrifice your liberty uh, for security, then you don't deserve neither security nor freedom. That may be a tough statement, uh, and I don't know if it's always true, but, but we know for sure that, that if, you, if you cut away uh, people's freedom, then you will get less freedom. But you can never be sure uh, if you get more security. Well, I'm very... pretty sure. I live in Sweden. So uh, they say we live in the safest country in the world. And for some reason, everyone around me seems afraid of everything all the time. Uh, exactly. And I think it has to do with their obsession about security because it exactly. makes you afraid of everything. Yeah. Um, just... And, and, and I, I, I think, in fact, that is... A, um, uh, it may have a special, um, we play itself out, out in a special way in Sweden, but I think this is a problem of, of, of the so-called free world, that, uh, that, that we prioritize security and safety to a degree that, that is just incompatible with freedom. And, you know, in the end, uh, life is dangerous. We're all going to die. Yes, but I mean, uh, we can compare your situation in Denmark to our own Lars Wilks, who also yes. made a, 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 well, he made, he actually sketched it himself. He not only ordered it, he sketched a Mohammed yeah. cartoon. And for that, he is now living like a prisoner in Sweden. Yeah. What's your opinion on we Lars Wilks? Because I know you've been in touch with him. 
Yes, and in fact, I wrote a piece for Dagens Nyheder, or it was also published in the Danish uh, media. Uh, I think Lars Wilks is being treated very badly by the Swedish uh, police and uh, authorities. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't violate the law. Uh, he was threatened and, and people several times tried to get at him and in fact kill him. And, and you know, the, the point of living with security in a democracy is that you can live with your life as you want to. That is, in fact, the challenge for me psychologically that I do all the things I want to do. And it's up to the security service to make sure that I'm safe. It's not up to me. I, the, the point of having security is that you can do all the things you want to. Uh, and you don't have to fear for your life. Um, and in that sense, I feel pretty free in Denmark, uh, even though I had to live in security and it's not always easy, I understand. But Lars Wilks, I mean, the Swedish authorities are imposing, uh, you know, very heavy limitations on 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 what he can do and what he can't do. And, and his advance notice to his security team, which has to be several days. Uh, so there's no spontaneity uh, in, in his life. And he cannot, uh, he cannot live with his uh, girlfriend uh, uh, because of, of, of so-called security reasons. And I can tell you, I asked my security team about that and they say it's, it's, uh, they, 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 they don't think it's, uh, it should be impossible to, to organize uh, security. Uh, um, uh, and at the same time, he would be able to live with his uh, girlfriend. It shouldn't be a problem. There's one more question I would like to... Actually, there's two more questions I'd like to ask you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one is about two international, you could call them articles or laws. Uh, one is the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, Article 20, Paragraph 2. And the other is on the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, Article 4. And I would like to ask you, uh, what are these laws and why are they problematic, to use the intersectionalist word? Yeah. Um, well, first, um, uh, I think these two articles are problematic because they serve as the foundation of hate speech laws all around the world. Uh, the um, uh, folk hits, I think, in, in Sweden, uh, hits more folk group, folk group, or uh, in, 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 in Denmark it's called uh, the law against racism. Um, and and um, the intention, you can say, that you wanted to criminalize um, uh, hateful speech targeting a specific group uh, is well intentioned in the aftermath of the Holocaust and because of what happened to Jews in uh, in, in Nazi Germany and other parts of Europe uh, during World War Two. But the problem is, in fact, first you had hate speech laws in Weimar Germany, and they didn't protect uh, the Jews uh, uh, that well. Uh, and the other thing is. That H, the, 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 the phrasing of uh, Article 20.2 of the Covenant on Political and Civil Rights was in fact initiated by the Soviet Union and Stalin's representative in the UN Committee. On, uh, on, on human rights that was chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt uh, in, in the 40s. And Eleanor Roosevelt uh, said at the time, if we, if we adopt this article uh, in this wording, it will be the perfect tool for a dictator to silence uh, dissenting voices. Because it was too broad, it was not just incitement to violence. It was incitement to hatred. Um, and, and, and that, you know, when I wrote the book, I looked into definitions and it turns out there is no clear definition of hate apart from dislike, you know, uh, uh, meaning that one man's hate speech is another man's comedy or poetry. 
um, and and it 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 makes it possible to uh, apply these laws against dissenting voices, and that is my main problem with uh, with these article. And this is exactly the way they had been used in the Soviet Union uh, after World War II and in other parts of the world. So I think. Uh, I would like to get rid of hate speech laws and just have laws criminalizing incitement to violence. Uh, it means getting lit, getting rid of hate speech laws and blasphemy laws. We 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 don't have a blasphemy law anymore in Denmark. It was in in fact repelled in the aftermath of the Khartoum crisis. Uh, you know, back and forth. For, I think we repelled it in 2017 or something like that. But in 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 a, in a world of social media. Uh, I think the trend is moving in the other direction. Obviously. That there is, yes, there is pressure for a broader definition of uh, of, of hate speech laws, and I think I I, I understand the emotion and uh, the instinctive reaction because you see harassment online. There is real harassment, and people committing harm, you know, uh, revenge porn. Uh, uh, all kinds of evil attacks uh, online, and we have to fight that. Um, but um, the problem is that these real cases of harm and harassment is being confused with just making people uncomfortable by saying things that that may be violating certain norms, but is not in any way, you know, causing harm. Um, so, so I think we have to work a lot more on, on, on making people resilient instead of fighting, you know, the content, uh, how, how do you cope with severe criticism and, and unpleasant things being, you know, said, uh, about you, uh, how do you cope with that? Because. You know, social media, I guess, is here to stay, and this will only scale up. Uh, we will not get less social media, and it means that you will have to remove billions of uh, Facebook postings to to fight this in, in in a consistent way. And I just think it's impossible. It's impossible to do this in a consistent and 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 proper way way on scale. Yeah, you, you write in your book that. Um... One thing one can take away from the dissident movement in the U, uh, in the Soviet Union was uh, their insistence on universal human rights, that everyone should have the same rights and responsibilities, and it should be individuals who have these rights and not groups. Exactly. So uh, I think that was nice. Can I ask you just one last question, sir? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, because I've been curious, because I get a feeling when I, I did research for this in the Swedish da article databases, that uh, uh, n not one single representative of our state radio or state television made an interview with you personally during the cartoon crisis. Did did anyone contact you at all from our state media? I think maybe I did one. I think I did one interview with Swedish media uh, back then. Uh, I don't longer anymore recall all the details, but. I will say this um, uh, that that I experienced a profound difference between the interest of other European media and Swedish media. I think also uh, I, I don't think the cartoons were in fact republished in any established uh, Swedish media while that happened in 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 other European countries apart from the UK. I think the the UK and Sweden. Um, were similar in 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 that sense, and I also um, I didn't, you know, I, I I didn't receive that many invitations to go to Sweden and and do public debates. Uh, there was one guy who I think he was a member of the European Parliament for the Christian Democrats in Sweden, a former. Uh, foreign correspondent. Uh, Lars in, in, exactly. Uh, he, in fact, invited me on his talk show twice. But I think he he is also an outlier. Yes. I, I don't think he is. Um, 
Uh, I, uh, That's why um, he's in the European par Parliament. We don't want him in Sweden anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, but but uh, but apart from that, uh, um, uh, I, I sense the difference, and I, I I don't think if you look at Norway, I would say that the cartoon debate was transformative for the Norwegian debate about all these issues, you know, integration, Islam, uh, peaceful coexistence, uh, freedom of expression, tolerance. While I don't think that the cartoons, in fact, affected Sweden uh, that much. Not it really. was like it was like a parallel uh, uh, universe. While it was a defining debate, I think in 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 even in Germany, I think, uh, but also in, in the Netherlands and especially in France because of Charlie Hebdo. Yes. Well, I want to thank you so much, both for taking the time and for writing this book, which was a pleasure. Uh, mm. I, I, I mark mm. pages in books I like, and I marked almost every page in your book. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm so sorry you sent it to me unsigned, and I hope that I'll get to meet you at some point in the future to get it signed. Absolutely. Um, and I very much look forward to reading your book. And and I hope that I can do an interview with you, you know, later uh, this spring or maybe closer to summer um, and, and talk about your situation and uh, what happened to you with, uh, with your book uh, and how all these issues look from, um, from your vantage point in, uh, in Sweden. It, they look exciting from my vantage point. I won in the first instance, but uh, the state prosecutor has appealed now, so I'm I'm uh, due in court again in the end by the by end of May, and uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but but, but I, you were acquitted in in the city court. Yes, yes, and uh, and That's now great. they uh, they they want five million and uh, probably some sort of sentence. But why why do they why do they continue? Uh, What's the point? Well, uh, I'd have to reply the same uh, way you uh, you replied about uh, Solanas. Uh, um, you have, have to them. ask them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it sounds a little bit uh, weird. Um, it's a bit Kafkaesque. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a principle. I mean, uh, that, that there are some principles at at play here, at stake. Yes freedom of speech in Sweden and the right to parody or satire anything you want, any way yeah. you please. That is at stake. And uh, uh, so I hope I don't lose for all our sakes. So do I. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we'll uh, speak again soon. Yeah, we'll stay in touch, uh, Ron, and I, I will try to keep... When, I, when, 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 when will the court case uh, take place? End of May, uh, uh, like 27th, of May. Okay. 28th of May, something like that. Okay, good. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Be well. Good to see you. Uh, yeah. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> you too. Thank you for listening to Deconstructed Criticism. This episode's guest was Fleming Rose, whose book The Tyranny of Silence is well worth the read. You can find links to the book at my webpage, aaronflam.com, in the description of this episode, and you will find the link to that in the description of this episode, regardless of what platform you're listening or viewing this on. Thank you for supporting Deconstructive Criticism. If you're not supporting me yet, you can do so on patreon.com slash aaronflam, in one word. patreon.com slash aaronflam or at swish number 0046-768-943737. If you want something more material for your support, please visit my webpage aaronflam.com slash merchandise, where you will find t-shirts and mugs with deconstructed criticisms creed, your feelings are hurting my thoughts, as well as my book This is a Swedish Tiger, about Sweden's own culture of silence, mainly concerning the Swedish Social Democrats' support to, and for, Hitler's Nazi Germany during the war, and how the Social Democrats of Sweden thereafter rekindled their friendship with another old ally of Hitler's, namely the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamists. The book has led to a court case against me by the state of Sweden, so if you want to know more about why I'm sued, I suggest you buy the book at aaronflam.com merchandise. My name is Aaron Flam. Until next, have a good unit of time.